Welcome everyone to another episode of Soul Chat. I am your host, Ebony Chatora, and these are the conversations that go deeper than the surface. And today I am honored to have a guest, the one and only Joe Spector. <laughs> Welcome, Joe. So first I'm going to read his bio and then we're going to ask the infamous question, what is your story? Because I believe stories are what threads us together as human beings. And it really takes away all the filters that we look through life and we realize, hey, we're all people. <laughs> who have a story, who've been through some things. Joe Spector is a retired firefighter turned podcast, podcaster, author, and emotional fitness instructor. After several years of subsequent traumas that led him to the brink of suicide, Joe chose to live, pursue radical wellness, and champion others to do the same. In 2017, Joe experienced a brain and spinal cord injury that left him medically disabled, costing him his health, income, and 15-year career in public service. His emotional recovery made him aware that first responders are in deep need of emotional literacy tools and a safe space to process their struggles. Since then, he has developed an emotional and mental fitness program for first responders, which he has been invited to share through his brand Grit, Growth, and Gratitude which is also an app. So welcome, Joe, to this space. I feel like every time I invite people on, the pre the pregame conversations, as we can call them, are always amazing and worthy of being recorded as well. Um, but welcome. Welcome to this podcast. Welcome to my community. I'm so excited to have you here. And um, let's talk to the audience about your story. What is your story in your own words? All right. I'm stoked to be here. Thank you for having me. Um there's such deep power in human beings sharing their story with each other. Um, and so I would say my story kind of starts out, uh, in 2017. I mean, my story starts out in 1982 when I was born, but the <laughs> relevant baby. stuff that you just read. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, latchkey kid. Um, but no, as a firefighter, I, I was just about to promote to captain. I had 15 years on the job, mm -hmm. um, married with two little happy kids, kind of just like a storybook life. Everything was going really well in my life, physically fit, um, hadn't suffered too much trauma and loss other than some like traumatic stuff on the job. Cause you know, you get exposed to some, a lot of death and mayhem on the job. But, um, I ended up, uh, right as I was getting promoted to captain, which is something I had been working for like 15 years for. Um, I ended up getting injured on the job, as you mentioned, and I had a, a brain injury and a vertebrae injury. And it just was like, I couldn't get any clearance from the doctors. I kept getting second and third opinions. Everybody was saying the nerve damage is permanent. There's no way that you can go back to the fire truck. So I ended up kind of being forced to take a medical retirement instead of getting my promotion. And so I lost my career very unexpectedly and very suddenly. And that type of career is like, you're gone for 48 hours at a time. You're working with your best friends. It's very culturally relevant to your personal life. And so it's a big chunk of identity gone too. And um, so that was very challenging, but that was just the start of a rough couple of years. Within a few a few subsequent years, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, uh, I'm getting distracted. I, uh, I ended up, my mom got dementia and kind of stopped recognizing me um, and my kids. Uh, I lost two of my best friends to a pretty gnarly. Uh, one was a potential suicide. One was a suicide. Um, my wife lost both her grandparents and I lost my grandma. I lost my grandma and my dog within a week. We just started like, it was like, I just got thrown into turmoil every week or two. Somebody was dying, loss of job, loss of income, like just left and right, left and right. Um, so, and every time we would lose my wife's grandma, my wife's grandpa, my mom to dementia, um, our dog, um, our two friends, every time we had a death, we were also having to deliver this news to my kids. Dad's no longer a firefighter. Grandma doesn't recognize you. Great grandma's dead. Great grandpa's dead. So it's like we were getting counseling to help us give these grief notifications to our children. Yeah, and cool. it was just chaotic for a couple yeah. of years. And, um, I was unprepared for all of that because like we mentioned, eighties kid, nobody talked to me about feelings growing up. Like, you know what I mean? If I was lucky enough to catch a PBS special, I learned something, the more, you know, maybe, but like nobody talked to me about grief or my nervous system or how to process anger in a healthy way or any mm -hmm. of that. And so for sure, I was very overwhelmed by all of that. And, um, because of my nature, I just kind of kept plugging away and kept going, like, I'm going to get through this. I'm going to get my family through, but my family was falling apart. My kids started getting, 
like they were very well adjusted, happy kids, and they were just getting kicked out of school. They were having all sorts of emotional turmoil because their whole world world just like changed, you know, in an instant. And then hot off the heels of all of that stuff it was just like one after the other, after the other, after the other. And um, so my wife was coping through alcohol and I was kind of just coping through like trying to stuff my feelings down and march forward because that's what I did. And um, my son started developing severe anxiety. My daughter started having these crazy emotional outbursts, being very dysregulated. And um, one day I um, just had a really, really bad day. I had um, I was going to physical therapy because part of my neurology is like my jaw would get locked up and they could go do these dry needling things on my neck and my jaw, which would fix it. And I was like heading to physical therapy to get it fixed. I was like thankful for that but I got diverted. I had to skip physical therapy because my daughter was getting kicked out of school. So I had to go pick her up and um, cause she was fighting with the principal, which is like became normal, but that was so abnormal for us. So I'm like dealing with all these different things. So I go pick her up. I'm getting like Mr. Rogers on TV, trying to get her calm down. Cause my kids are like five and six at this time, six and seven actually. And, um, and then my dad calls me and my mom had, like escape the house because he's full-time dementia care for her and she's in the middle of the street trying to like get into people's cars almost causing car accidents so i like get my daughter set up on the tv she's not even old enough to be left alone but like it's an emergency so i like lock the doors up i my jaws locked up i go leave and i'm like trying to help my mom but she doesn't recognize me she's like yelling f you to me and all this stuff because she, that's like dementia can make you act insane like that's where yeah. my mom was like so sweet and then mm -hmm. she got her personality just got hijacked by the disease and she got mm -hmm. really ugly in dementia. And so she, I felt bad, but also sad and cars are honking and I'm like in pain. And then I don't remember what happened later that day. My wife and I are fighting. She was drinking. I think like, uh, by the way, she shares too. like uh, this part of this is her ver journey and her healing. I'm going to share a little bit about that, but I have permission from her to share, but, um, I, I don't know what happened, but like my attitude of like, I can get through this just like, stop that day and so i never had suicidal ideations i never really fought like depression where i was like i'm gonna end this nothing like that but i just my mind and my body finally hit a breaking point after that day and i ended up kind of going into like a i don't know if you would call it like a fugue state or something but like i left my house and i have no recollection of the drive and i just i drove to a parking lot and i put a gun my gun in my mouth and it was like I had like my heart was like beating out of my chest. I was like hyperventilating. I was like seeing red. And it was just this weird like out of body experience where like I truly felt like compelled to kill myself. And I learned later on that was like my body and my mind hitting a breaking point. Like when your check engine light is on your car, but you don't know the check engine light is on. And finally, the mm -hmm. car breaks down. I had pushed so far. I should have gotten help so much sooner. Mm -hmm. And I honestly was like, I had my gun in my mouth and my finger on the trigger and I was like pulling the trigger and ready to do it. And I did not want to do it. It was so, it sounds, it's very hard for me to explain this. I felt like when you put your hand on a stove and you have to pull it off, like I felt like I had to do this and I was like sobbing. I didn't want to do it. And I've been meditating for a long time and I was trying to like catch my breath and I couldn't. And finally I got a deep meditative breath, just and I was able to take the gun out of my mouth, create some space. And then all of a sudden it was like a trance was broken. And I was like, I cannot believe that just happened. I threw the gun in the gut blocks and I like jumped out of my car. Like the gun was the end. Started throwing up. I was sobbing. I was like, T I'm tapping out. God, like help me. Like I, I, now I realize that's a threat. I won't ever let that happen again, but I don't know how, like I'm still lost. My family is still a mess. So I kind of collected myself and I just was like, if you know me, everybody who knows me thinks that this is shocking that this happened because everybody thought I was handling my challenge as well. And I have this jovial attitude. I was shocked too. That was insane. I never in a million years would have imagined that that then that's kind of why I'm passionate about sharing candidly about this, because whether it's screaming at your kids or struggling through addiction or being suicide or just having anxiety and depression, a lot of people especially like masculine dudes think that this cannot happen to them. I'm as tough as they come and it happened to me. So I want to share that with people. And so I called my friend Branley. He lives by me. He's a fire captain too. I said, you're never going to believe this dude. I just almost killed myself. Can I come give you my gun? 
I don't really know what's up or down right now. And I don't, I don't think that'll happen again, but I don't trust myself. And he was like, yeah, of course, bro. And I went over to his house. We were like crying. I, I called the, this therapist and it was an after hours number. I had a resource from the fire department. I was just like, Hey, I don't know what just happened. I literally just almost killed myself and I need help. And I got into therapy and then I kind of had a come to Jesus talk to my wife. I was like, you're like drinking a lot. Our kids are failing and I just almost killed myself. We have to like, whatever we're doing right now is not working. And she was very brave and it was, she's a teacher and it was like May. She checked herself into an outpatient facility. So she's like, all right, I'm, I'm all in. Like I want to get healed up too. And then I got into deep into therapy. And then while she was at outpatient, like eight hours a day, I would take my kids to therapy and then we'd be doing grief workbooks with my kids, anxiety workbooks. And then I'd go to my own therapy and we just spent like a year, like learning all of these skills that I wish we would have had before these things hit because we even lost more people and had more financial hardship and things, but like we were able to cope and communicate without fighting and regulate our nervous systems and our emotions. And like, even my kids, their biggest struggles now they like, teach their friends how to be emotionally regulated because these are skill sets that any human being can learn. And we all have emotions and we all have nervous systems and we all experience challenges. And you like have to know all of these standardized test things in school, but this stuff doesn't really get taught. And so I started kind of sharing and opening up this story with some of my friends on the fire department. And I was kind of embarrassed to talk about it, even though it's comfortable now because it's been years and I talk a lot on this, but I was uncomfortable until the first guy cracked open and started telling me about his struggles and then the next and then the next. And I was like, Oh shit, we have a huge problem. I'm not the only one, you know? And, um, same thing with my wife started talking about our marriage struggles or drinking. And it was like, so many of our friends are struggling in silence and going through these things, or maybe not as extreme as ours, but struggling and needing help. So then we just were like mission driven. Let's start talking. And that's when I started my podcast, which then led to me being invited to speak to different fire departments which then led to them asking me to create training. So then now I have this business going with all of this, but it it evolved organically as me just going through it and then sharing about it. So to circle back to you, the power of sharing a story with other human beings. Now I teach this stuff and grown men are talking to their kids about emotions. And instead of hitting the bottle or screaming at their families, they're checking in with their breath and writing down their feelings and stuff. And it's really amazing. And uh, that's kind of what has led me to connecting with you and talking to you today. Yeah, well, we're going to give a huge shout out to Monty uh, Lyons. I believe that's how you say his last name for connecting us. Um, and Kingston. <laughs> and Kingston, who is is here with us. First, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much for sharing um, the depth of your story. Um, because we can have a lot of shame around um just, you know, all of those things, talking about suicide. Um, so definitely thank you for sharing that. Like my whole heart was wrapped in the story because I definitely, now that I think about it, I think probably about two years ago, and I've shared this on previous podcasts, I didn't reach, you know, it wasn't very, it wasn't that I was suicidal, maybe a little bit, but it was more so like I had given up on just wanting to be a coach. And now that I think about it, I was at my breaking point, you know, I, and, and even though similarly I've worked and done different things, I think a lot of times um, that is our culture is we think you'll be fine, just get through it, or you, you use your tools. Um, lucky enough that I've had friends that are therapists that were by my side, you know, um, so I think that's probably what got, got me through it the most is that I, I broke my silence. I actually broke my silence. So instead of just pretending to be okay and, you know, not talking about it. I really opened up and leaned into community, but thank you for sharing that story because I know that whether people are uh, dealing with an extreme as that or not, I think just 2020 to now, I think a lot of people are recognizing that we're not as mentally fit as we thought we were, <laughs> you know? Um, 100%. So that's like thank really you for good. sharing your they start energy. Thank you for sharing that with me and for listening too. And you're, you're right. Um, there's shame and stigma around this, but um, it's actually the bravest thing that you can do. It's yeah. not brave to stick your head in the sand or to be unaware or, uh, to, or to be afraid to share. I don't judge that, but just like a lot of people are afraid to open up and say, I'm struggling yeah. or I'm having limitations or I'm burnt out or I'm hitting a breaking point or maybe mm -hmm. I'm not suicidal, but 
I've lost hope or I'm burnt out or I'm not looking, you know, enjoying life. Yeah. It's the bravest thing that you can do. It's very hard to do that. So I'm kudos to you. And I think 2020 shined a light to a lot of people that, oh man, just going through the motions every day. And now I'm forced to deal because we really learn how resilient and emotionally fit we are when we're faced with adversity. And that was like the whole world hit adversity for a couple of years. And so then you get, that's when the rubber meets the road and you get to realize, do you really have these coping skills or you just think you do and you don't know. And it's so much better to get ahead of these things and to support each other with community and to share these tools and to practice these tools. It's like you hit the nail on the head, emotional, it's fitness. It's like, it start working out and dieting and exercising at any time, but it's way better if you can do it before you have COPD, heart disease or diabetes, you know what I mean? And so there's a lot of prevention can be done if you take an honest look at where you're at and you practice these skills and, and community support is huge too. Yeah, it's huge. And you just never know. I think that's the other thing is that we just really, it, it's such a mind. It, I always say the biggest lie in this life is that you are alone. That's probably the biggest lie that everyone thinks that I am singular in my struggles. I am singular. Like it just, it's, it's probably, it's so, it, it's very self, sabotaging because it's not true you know and when you know you talked about opening up to fire other firefighters and them saying well yeah like I'm, I'm struggling with stuff too and then it really opens your eyes to like wow like when should I have started talking about this do you know what I mean and yes. I'm pretty sure even through that you've saved some lives and some families um especially with men um I think um you know because I I'm I'm only girl and I remember my brother recently sharing with me, he's like, I haven't cried in 10 years. And I'm like, that's not normal. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? That is not normal to not cry. I mean, I get it. I get being strong and all of that. But um, I think we are culturally needing to shift that narrative of what is viewed as strong. And you said that, right? It's not strong to put your head in the sand and to keep going and to act like the thing doesn't exist, right? Because if there's one thing that will eat us alive, it's emotions. And in my practice, I teach how emotions literally leads to disease, you know, 100%. heart disease, like all of it, right? Stress is the number one cause of all the diseases we could talk about for days, right? But we don't really talk about the stress or we don't really talk about how we don't breathe and we don't really talk about how we hold our breath in times of distress. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk about some of the tools that you talk about when you give presentations on how do we really regulate our emotions, definitely through seeking help. And I love that you brought up grief. That was something that I faced in 2020 that I realized. I just remember this heavy feeling. I left this relationship I was in for 11 years. We had four children together. And I just felt this heaviness. And I was like, for me, I've learned to just sit with the emotions long enough to hear the story. And when I sat with the emotion, I, I heard loud and clear, this is grief. You are grieving. And I think if I had just done what I always do, which is like, let's just keep going. It's fine. You know, it's like I wouldn't have had, you know, I had to really grieve grieve cry I had to cry it out until there were no more tears left for all the emotions like feeling like a failure feeling like I wasn't a good mom like all the feelings until I came back to a sense of wholeness and understanding that I really needed that experience he's telling us this shit. <laughs> okay okay <laughs> um but share with us some of the techniques and tools that you share to help others navigate their emotions Oh, that's wild. Because the way you said with your brother is like a similar experience to me. So I got in that counselor's office and he started walking me through like something as simple as sitting in your feelings or labeling them and crying it out. I had never done like I and so I had not cried since I was a little kid, literally. And I had all these deaths stacked up and the loss of my career, my family failing. So he started talking to me about these things and I just started sobbing and I'm like snot coming out of my nose. I'm crying and I look at him and I go, I literally, this is embarrassing because now I'll cry. I don't care. Shameless. But I, I looked at him, I go, what is happening to me? And he goes, you're crying. It's a normal human way to process emotions. Like he was like, it's normal, bro. Like you're feeling a feeling. And I'm like, D it was so foreign to me to cry because I, and then I started reflecting back, trying to remember, like, was it on the schoolyard? Like, I don't know if I've cried since I was like 10 years old and I'm coming up on 40 at this, you know, I was 36 when that happened. Thank I'm like, you. that's messed up because that 
is the body's way of purging those feelings. It's a very healthy tool to get that out of your system. So you're not clenching up or holding your breath or yelling at your loved ones or whatever. And, uh, I challenge and I push back a lot of the masculine men and the firemen because like I've done the job with them. I've kicked in the doors. I've gone in the burning buildings while people are running out. And so if they want to think that it's weak to cry, I will tell them one of us is willing to do the thing that's very uncomfortable. And one of us is not, which one is it? What is bravery other than stepping outside of your comfort zone? You're afraid to cry. I'm the brave one. Are you scared? And then I'll, I'll joke around. Like, are you scared to show your emotions? Are you scared? Cause like when you challenge those guys, they're like, I'm not scared, you know? And it's like, then let me hear you feel your feelings, bro. You're taking it out on your family. That's not brave. And so, um, but the tools to circle back to what you were saying is, so I teach firefighters are almost all EMTs, emergency medical technicians too. We do like medical stuff and firefighting. So I use the umbrella. I shifted EMT to emotions, mind, emotional processing, mindfulness and meditation. And then T is talking about your feelings. And under those umbrellas, I just kind of teach all of the things that professionals taught me and my family, but just in a language that the everyday guy or the everyday first responder can understand. So learning to label your emotions on a very basic level is super important. Pulling out the feelings wheel. It seems silly to look at that, but when you, most men will never say like, Hey, this happened. And I felt blank. Like these guys made fun of me at work and I felt embarrassed. Most guys don't even have the word embarrassed or shame in their vocabulary. And so a lot of times anger is the only emotion we're culturally allowed to show. And so we harm people where whether we're blowing up in traffic, we're screaming at our loved ones. And underneath that tip of the iceberg where you see anger is like childhood trauma, shame, embarrassment, anxiety, all of these things. And so learning to just say this happened and I felt blank, like this guy cut me off in traffic and I felt angry. My kids are yelling at me and I felt triggered. My mom died and I feel really sad. Like, basic stuff, which sounds so basic to me now, but like, these are skills that I did not have. And most of my peer group doesn't have. So, um, and then just learning that I like to teach these guys because I, they understand different things like firefighting and fitness, like in firefighting, you don't just go into a house and put the fire out. You, you gather up your Intel, they call it your fire ground fitness, uh, your fire ground factor. So you go, what type of building construction, where's the fire located? What type of smoke is coming out? Are there victims? And then you formulate a plan and that's how you have success. Our emotions are our intel. If you're not, it's like ignoring the building construction or the location of the fire if you don't recognize these things. So gather your intel on your, your relationships and your life. Emotions are your intel. And so learning what does grief feel like? What does anger feel like? What does joy and happiness and the good emotions feel like? And how to process them. Did I lose you? It looks like you're frozen. Yeah, I have you frozen, but I can still hear you. So we'll keep going. I got your back. Okay. Back. <laughs> um, and then it's not a one size fits all thing. Like if you want to get physically fit, you can do boxing, you can do yoga, you can look weights, you can do CrossFit. There's a million different things you can do. So trying different things out to process different emotions, but starting with the basics, like sharing an experience. I always tell guys blank happened and I felt blank. And if you don't know how you feel, look at that emotions wheel, like get back from a rough call and go, man, when that baby passed away, I felt scan that wheel your brain will tell you what you're feeling oh helpless that's how i was feeling i didn't have a word for it and you say those wow. things and like instantly you feel better and science has proven it it can reduce the physiological effects by 50 percent just by throwing the right word on a label to your feeling um and it amplifies the good vibes like my daughter got straight A's. she gave me a big old hug and i felt happiness i felt joy like tell a call a friend dude i felt so happy like that's what life is like amplify the good vibes minimize the negative vibes getting into journaling and writing. Um, some guys are really nonverbal start. If you're mad, don't yell at your kids, go punch a punching bag, go do some sprints. Like they call it with the kids. I learned a lot of this stuff with my kids. They call it, move it to lose it. Like my son, I'm like, do you want a consequence or do you want to do 50 burpees? I'm not making you do the burpees, but it's good for you. You're really mad right now. And you're screaming at me. You can lose your screen or you can do 50 burpees. And then he feels good. And it's like, if you move your body, sometimes that's processing emotions or be willing to cry or just like all these different, there's a lot of different one-on-one level tools to just kind of get in touch with our emotions. And then mindfulness and meditation, mission critical, because that is like, I use the check engine light a lot. Like I believe that meditation gives us access to our dashboard and you would never drive your car without looking at the dashboard. 
you might be able to do it for a while, but you're going to run out of gas or get a speeding ticket or have the check engine light going off, like what was going on with me, the check engine light. But if you don't stop and observe your thoughts and your breath and your body and get used to getting in tune with your machinery, you're driving the most important vehicle of your life, which is your mind, your body, and your spirit without looking at the dashboard. And plus it does a whole bunch of other amazing stuff. Like it relaxes your nervous system and gives you longevity and prevents disease and different things. But I just really believe in a daily practice of breath work and labeling and observing your feelings and calming your mind and your body down. And that's kind of how a lot of times we don't know. And you do a meditation, you're like, oh man, my jaw is clenched. Or like you said, I'm holding my breath and, it, and or I'm having a lot of ruminating thoughts and anxiety that I wasn't even aware of. And so, and then T, talking, just normalizing this type of dialogue, removing the stigma and the shame, finding like-minded people, find a safe person. For guys, it can be hard if you're vulnerable and you share your feelings, they may be fun of you. But like, find one or two people who you really trust and who you can practice this with and just talk. Like, men, we bottle it up to everybody's detriment and you deserve to share your feelings and to be heard empathetically and to listen back to your friends. That's a beautiful human connection, sharing stories and feelings. So, um, and we're never going to really overcome this unless we remove the shame and the stigma. And we do that by changing the culture, by talking about it. So it's way more, I have like a whole curriculum, but it's broken down to those things, EMT. That is so amazing. And I'm sure you guys can see I'm wrestling a tiger over here. Um <laughs> So we're going to, I'm going to take a quick pause. Take um, a time out. That's okay. Yeah. Quick pause to get him a bottle. Um, that, that way he will have our time and then we'll come right back to this. All right. So we are back and I love everything that you just shared on, on every level. And I think a lot of people listening to this will be able to look at the ways that we're really navigating things, you know, and it, and it's like, if we, as a human race can understand that emotions, like you said, they're the indicators, right? That it's not just road rage, right? It's not just that person annoys you. It's not, it's not just that, right? We have to be willing to follow that thread. And when you talk about tears, it's so funny because I remember growing up, not really seeing my mom cry. And I had that I had that perception where I thought, I actually thought that was very weak, <laughs> which is so funny to say those things these days. So I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to cry. <laughs> if I got to cry. I'm crying. Right. And sometimes it's, you could just have a day as a parent where you're like, I feel like everything could be fine, but it could have just been one of those days. And the release of it is like, I just feel overwhelmed today. Right. Yes. And really sitting with it to, to acknowledge it. And then you talked about the, um, the vocabulary of emotions, right? I think we only really learn like happy, sad, like there's like five of them that everyone knows, right? Um, Most men actually... know like happy and angry and that's it. And I'm like, <laughs> when I check these in these guys, I'm like, there's way more than two, you yes. guys, are you kidding me? <laughs> right, right, right. And and it's, it's important, like you said something that was so profound that I feel like in the healing world, it's like being sick, right? It's like once you know, okay, I have a common cold. So this is the medication I need to take, or this is the tea that I can drink. Like if you don't know, you can't really help yourself, right? You can't get the help that you need. And if you know, okay, well, this is prolonged grief, or this is like, you know, I grew up with parents who had mental illness. So the more that I kind of went the opposite direction, because I, I almost went into the field of psychology and then I realized it wasn't for me, <laughs> but full circle, I became a life coach. Um, but I had learned going in the opposite direction, looking into different healing modalities. Well, maybe depression is like one emotion or a few emotions that you just never dealt with. And now you have this disposition of, well, I'm depressed, right? But I think if you really unraveled it, it's a myriad of sadness, anger, grief, all of these things that you just never dealt with. And like I said, I never uh, saw my mother cry. So I thought it was something you did behind closed doors or you never did, right? And if you did it, that meant you were weak. And I, I actually, someone recently said to me, you know, only babies cried. I'm like, but they cry because it represents their strength though. And where does that come from? Why do, like, why do we say only babies cry? Like that's, yeah. 
that's a, I think that's a projection of somebody who's afraid to tap into their emotions and do the mm -hmm. hard work that you're talking about, but it's also no judgment. It's they feel that way because that's exactly what they were taught and modeled yeah. growing up. Like you and me, I felt that yeah. way too, but also like, it feels so much better on the other side. And when you For get sure. a good cry out, like you feel a thousand pounds you lighter. Do. And when you, it's nice to not be depressed because you're processing these things on a regular basis. And I don't mm -hmm. think people know, um, like what you said too, you brought up a really good point. I, I think the emotions are indicators and then they tell you what you need to do. And so yeah. like you might need to hold a boundary or defend yourself or make an yeah. argument, but you might also need to cry or you might need to have a tough conversation, but this mm -hmm. anger that you're feeling like, what is it? Like, why am I feeling this way? And then if you can unpack and get clarity on your emotions, then you can learn what they're telling you and then what action you need to take yeah. to feel happy and to mm -hmm. feel joy and to thrive and to have good connection with your yeah. loved ones. And um, a lot of times we just uh, put our head in the sand and we are unaware and we ignore them. And I, I say all of this, like not from a place of judgment, but like I was entirely deficient in all of these tools and all of this awareness. And mm -hmm. it almost cost me my life. And it definitely sadly hurt my family. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to share that, uh, like be aware, don't shy away from the problem, but also these are skills just like anybody gets out of shape. And then you're like, Oh man, I'm kind of lean. I didn't think I was out of shape, but I just got a heart scan done and I have, you know, high cholesterol or whatever. Like, yeah, that's okay. You can do something about it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And we can, you can, and, and we can support you while you do it and we can teach you the way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I don't think we live culturally yet where emotions are, um, I don't think they're honored and respected as they should be yet. You know, I haven't seen yeah. that. I've done a lot of work where I go into schools and I teach little girls about self-love. And I remember we had this one session and it, it the way I start is very laissez-faire. So it's not like all in, let's just talk about healing, right? And it, at this point I had gotten into a school where I started with high school girls and I'm like, okay, some of these girls, they're like older than me. Like, they're like, we know it all already. We don't, we don't want to hear anything you have to say, Right. Um, so we kind of switched the model. We started doing fourth and fifth grade girls. And I remember just hearing girls open up about, oh, my dad did this and I felt this way. And, you know, it really just shows that, you know, when you're dealing with a kid, just like you talked about your kids, right? And that's even shame, right? Where we are well-to-do parents who we've done our best. And then your kids are like, it's like a shit show, right? When they're in school and you're like, yes. wow, right? But I think if you didn't have the mindset to understand, they're dealing with a lot, right? They would like much other kids, they would get labeled and placed in different classrooms. And then, you know, we're really, we're creating structures to not deal with the emotions, but to, to almost like shun them for their emotions. Right. Um, and, and to not really, you know, honor the emotions as they are. Okay. Well, this kid is angry. You know, like sometimes there are kids who haven't eaten for the day or they they're watching their parent go through domestic violence or like there's so many things that are happening. And even you talking about dementia, I watched this. It was a small video about a woman who was like talking to her mom and her mom was like, stop calling me mom. You know? And it's just like, I think a lot of times we don't realize that even if when like your kids are upset or your partner is upset, like so it's like taking a beating sometimes. It's just like, you're just doing your best to navigate the emotions. And if you yourself don't have an outlet, you just, you're just packing them all on, right? It doesn't matter how, who you are, or how strong you think you are. We can only carry so much before there is that breaking point or we're yelling at someone or we're, you know, we're at our job and we're, you know, irritated with a customer. And it's like, if we can all just kind of rein that in and bring honor and respect to emotions as to me, they're like visitors. Like, I think the most perfect movie as you were talking, because I tell all my clients, you need to go watch Inside Out. <laughs> it's Inside Out and Inside Out 2 are the most profound movies ever made. Like, I don't know how they did such a good job at explaining mm -hmm. the way memories and emotions are created and yeah. processed. They're, they're like game changers. It is. It is. So if you are an adult, you're watching this, you've never seen Inside Out, I need you to go watch it as as homework because even when yes. I first watch, I mean, when I watch all kids' movies, I always take something away as the parent, right? <laughs> and I'm Me like, too. 
Then I'm like talking but to that my one was like next level though. That one that like taught was. me a lot about my own emotions. And I was right yes. in the middle of all of this journey while that was going on. And wow. I was like, this is a game changer. This movie, it is. The, this is one where the adults need it more than the kids. It is. Yeah. Because you remember joy, what she was doing. And I think this is what we all do, right? You kind of, you know, you kind of, um, you, you become a, a decent adult, right? And you're like, let me be positive. Let me be happy. You know, we're, we're all doing better than what we thought our parents did and blah, blah, blah. Right. And we're, you know, it's almost like this toxic positivity where it's like, let me be positive. Let's get through it. Like that motivation part of like getting through life. I focus on three things, mindset, uh, mindset, mastery, mindfulness and inner child healing. And I think a lot of times I was too in the mindset mastery. Let me master my mind. Let me be positive. Let me, you know, and it's like, that's what Joy was trying to do. She was like, let's just be happy. It's fine. Let's just be happy. Let's just be happy. Let's just be happy. It's fine. Yeah. It's like sadness was like, but it's not fine. And I'm not fine. <laughs> you know, and like, I need you to listen to me, you know? It's both. You have to that mindset is incredible. And that's why we do amazing things. And we build that fortitude and we reframe yeah. our thoughts. But you also have to honor and process the challenging emotions and sit in them and feel them. It's both, right? Yeah. And I think you, I was thinking about, I kind of, uh, that person who said only babies cry. Do you know, it's interesting how much like anger is socially acceptable, but sadness is not. Mm -hmm. Babies also throw temper tantrums. But we see grownups throwing temper tantrums all the time and nobody's really time. saying, look in, look in traffic or look at what the <laughs> politics we talk about. Like yes. people are screaming on YouTube and I'm like, yeah. you're literally having an adult temper tantrum yeah, right absolutely. now. That's what losing your temper is. Like ah. anger is normal. Losing your temper means you have a lack of emotional regulation skills, bro. And so, but it's so funny how we'll be like, oh, you puss or you're a baby cry. But like you have temper tantrums like a little kid too. So like, let's quit judging and let's just honor our emotions here and everybody can grow and connect and get mature here together because yeah. it's wise and mature. Whether you like it or not, we all have emotions. They're mission critical. They're part of the human experience and they're difficult at first, but they make you thrive when you do the things that you just talked about. Inner child work, that's the hardest one of all. But boy, is this so rewarding when you get rid of that inner voice and you deconstruct your childhood and you heal and nurture yourself. And then you realize you're giving your kids the gift of doing something that was never given to you and all that stuff. Like inner child work is the hardest work ever, but it is like the most rewarding happiness, amplifying work you could possibly do to like learn how to give yourself all this validation that you didn't even know you need and you weren't given in childhood. Pretty remarkable to sit there and know, okay, I'm not a perfect parent. My kids are still you know, they're probably going to be in counseling in their thirties for all the effed up stuff I'm doing that I don't even know about totally. right now, just like we are, <laughs> but I'm taking a stand and I'm making sure that I'm loving myself so that I can model for them how yeah. to love themselves. And I'm at least creating space for them to do like, that's game changing stuff. Like, you, you know, uh, even on your worst day, when you're crying and you're feeling overwhelmed, you're like, it's a shit show. Like you said, at mm -hmm. least, you know, like I'm giving more than I got and I'm doing the yeah. healing work for them. Like, dude, you could take a lot of that can make a a bad day much better when you really reflect on that stuff yeah. and so it's awesome that you teach that stuff it's very important and it's, yeah the world is resistant to healing their inner child and men don't even want to talk about it like sorry bro i'm uncomfortable that i got a little eight-year-old unnurtured kid inside of me too yeah but you do too bro it's showing yes. on your daily behaviors and your actions left and right yeah and so if you just tap in and give yourself some love also i think it's i think it's crazy you only have one relation. There's only one person who you have a relationship with who you're going to be around 24, 7, 365. And that's you. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a critical dickhead to yourself, that's just <laughs> as crazy as acknowledging you have an inner child and being nice to yeah. it and nurturing it. I, I quite frankly like that I've shifted to becoming my own best friend mm -hmm. and that I like the world is going to be hard on you enough if you yeah. can like it's just wild though. We go through with this default of being self-critical yeah. and like myself doesn't matter. And mm -hmm. I, it's just, it's, it seems crazy now I'm on the other side of it, but it was yeah. normal for me, you know? Yeah. I call it the adult ego. So although I've known about the inner child since I was about 13, just like praying for wisdom, I was like, God, why did you give me these parents? Um, and then I learned about that. And then at 15, I had taken psychology, this whole long story. And I was like, I'm going to be a psychologist. I actually almost went to forensics. That's why I didn't go in forensics. I went to Syracuse University for forensics. And I remember we had to do, you know, mock autopsies and things. And I was like, I'm going to be an alcoholic. If I got to watch dead bodies and people have killed other people, and this is like my everyday life, there's no way I'm going to be a normal person. Like I knew that I was probably like 18 or 19. I was like, no way. 
there's no way I'm going to be a normal person. Like I foresaw my future. I was like, yeah, not going to do this. This is a great course. <laughs> I've learned a lot. You know, I, the, the gas chromatograph is amazing for extracting all the elements from like a dollar bill and different things. So we know what's in it, the blood, whatever. And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing it. Um, but I, I call it the the adult ego where we think, okay, well, I have kids, I have a job, I pay bills, I do this. Like I'm an adult. I don't need to work on that. And it's like your inner child always lives within you. You just, I mean, think about life. You literally go to sleep, you wake up and you're bigger. You go to sleep, you wake up, you have hair in other places. You go to sleep, you wake up, you're taller. You go to sleep, you wake, you know what I mean? It's just, that's that's how life progresses is you go to sleep and you wake up and you're, you're, a, new, you're a different person, right? And next thing yeah. you know, you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm approaching this age, right? You're like, whoa, I was just a kid, right? Um, yeah. So I believe, you know, I always share that to me, I view it as like, you know, in history when you had the timeline with the dots, it's like World War II, World War whatever. And then yeah. it's like, I feel like our lives are exactly the same thing. They're just a myriad of dots. And if you not, if you are unwilling to go back and say, well, why am I always so angry? Why am I always so sad? Why am I so cynical? Why am I so sarcastic? Even sarcasm is filled with so much sadness. Like, you know, like, and I really listen to people, you know, and, and, and I think a lot, you know, depending on what we've gone through, other people may have up higher walls, <laughs> you know, resistance yeah. to that information because they know that once they crack it, they crack. And then it's just this, all the same, the emotions get to come out. And I think sometimes we're afraid of that um, because it does look weak. And you said something that's like, it is socially accessible to be angry and not to be sad, right? We want to, if someone's sad, it's like, okay, it's fine. You know, and it's like, I remember, I don't know where I was, but I remember someone started crying, maybe on a Zoom or something. And no one, no one ran to aid that person. And it wasn't, and it was a healthy Zoom. It was like a healing circle type of thing, but we allowed the emotion to be. Like we waited for the person to just like, it almost like energetically invite us to like, okay, now I'm ready to be consoled. And we do that sometimes with kids. You know, I was on a call where a lot of women were like, well, um, like in my household, I don't know. I don't think we really dealt with emotion that we all kind of just like hid them or, you know, things like that. But a lot of women were like, well, I could cry in my house, but there was like a time limit. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's crazy. <laughs> you mean like, okay, you're done crying now. Um, the last thing I will say that I do have another question. Is my son has, you know, definitely been displaying those characteristics of like, you know, he does, you can tell like sometimes, and he's only five, you know, so I, I give him so much grace. Um, and he's very smart. You know, but sometimes when it comes to being sad um, or angry, you know, like for him, it's like, well, I don't want to talk about it. Right. I don't want to talk about it. So yesterday he started crying and it was about these grapes we have. And I was like, you know, I just I just let him cry. And I'm like, you know, Levi, like what if whatever you want to say to me, you know, I need you to just stop yelling because I want to hear what you have to say. And then he was like, it's not about the grapes. It's actually about my dad. You know, and I just was like. Like, I don't know if he'll remember that moment, but I felt like it was so amazing to see him learn how to be like, oh, well, it wasn't about the grapes. It was actually about this. And this is how I feel. Okay, well, let, let me come give me a hug. You know, do you want to talk about it? You know, and it's like, for me, I feel like, you know, especially as parents, I feel like there's no rule book. My mom said this to me all the time, right? There's no rule book. And sometimes, you know, I, that's my, that's personally my indicator is their willingness to talk to me about hard things. And also my ability to not react, my ability to, you know, if it's like about boys or things that may not be entirely appropriate, right? Like, oh, it's I've so hard. Found... I have a beautiful little tween daughter. It's so hard <laughs> not to react, but I'm a safe space. And I, but I do it. I, it I cultivate that. And it's like, I'm the dad that she goes to with those things. And you have right. to be very careful to earn that trust and that influence. And it's yes. so hard because internally I'm like, no, yes. 1000%. Oh hey, but, yeah. but like, it's also such an, you're a plus by the way, for him doing that. The fact that you're able yeah. to do those tools and that a plus on him and a plus on you. That was amazing that uh, they're incredible with how they can actually, they're so much better than us adults at tracing the roots back to their feelings. If we give them the space and the tools yes. and the safe, uh, adult to help them through that yeah yeah and it's so funny you said that because i i recently you know i just probably what i would say in the past two and a half years um i just have to sleep on things i just have to go to sleep because you know that initial you know you're just like i want to choke you 
Like, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Right. And then it erodes their trust, right? Now they're afraid to speak. Yeah. Now they're afraid to share. And then it's like, then there's no communication. There's no authenticity in that connection. So I've learned, let me just go to bed. We're all going to go to bed. We're just going to sleep on this and we'll talk about it tomorrow. <laughs> there's so much power in taking space from things or sleeping. You know, they always say, don't go to bed angry. Like, I say the opposite. Very few things urgently need to be addressed. And if emotions are running hot, there's a lot of power in getting a good night of sleep. And it, we're not like ignoring the issue. We're just tabling it for a minute or for a night. Yeah. And um, I think I think it's very powerful to not tell your kids, why would you do that? Like, it's, it's like, I want to say that a thousand times a day. Like, yeah. why the fuck would you do that? <laughs> but like, all you do is put up a wall then like, okay, you're judging me, dad. Like, yes. it's, so it's like, tell me more about that. Yeah. How were you feeling? Mm -hmm. You know, how can I help? Those types of provocative questions and yeah. then like creating a safe space that's like it's a long game but you build that trust and that influence but we have to fight our nature because i want i want to i always want to say why would you do that and i remember listening to a child psychologist when i was going through all this say like that's one of the most harmful things you can say to your kid and i'm like shit i say it a hundred times a day so i've trained myself not to now but that's like that's our natural instinct is to say that phrase but it like it, it creates a barrier and it's like I, I saw a meme that said, like, do you want if your kids, God forbid, are doing like drugs or something like sex or whatever, like, do you want them to say like, oh, shit, I can't let my dad find out or oh, shit, I got to call my dad. I need help. And I'm like, I don't want the thing to happen. But if it does happen, I want them to be like, I got to call dad. And you earn that. You don't get that. You're not entitled to that. You earn that through like connection and nurturing. And it doesn't mean you're passive and you don't have logical consequences or discipline. If people get confused on the nuance, it doesn't mean, of course, you're the adult and you're guiding them, but like, are you doing more connecting or more correcting? Are you sharing that safe space? Do they feel like they can come to you without judgment? Like what's more important to have the final say in the judgment or to like, no, damn, this world is crazy and there's predators out there and everything vying for their attention and their time. And I want them to see me as that anchor point that they can go to. And it's hard to earn that. You have to earn it and you put it in through healing yourself and creating, you know, <laughs> this is too cute. Um, <laughs> I will smile. Um, but like, you're doing a great job with that. Get, like no, that's, that's hard work for that's, it's hard to parent. There is no handbook and there certainly is no handbook in the age of TikTok and social media and all this crazy stuff that's going on. And even if you limit the intake that your kids have, they're getting it at school or with their friends. It's, it's, 1, it's very challenging to parent right now. <laughs> it is. It is, you know, and I found, I mean, it's just like with anything, right? When we create resistance to, you know, shielding them and blocking them, it's just like, you know, you're better off giving them the tools to navigate. And again, you said something, right? It, it has to come to ourselves, right? If How am I going to teach them how to emotionally regulate if I don't emotionally regulate? You know, yes. and even coming to the, you know, like my, my daughter was talking to me the other day, it was so late and I was like, okay. I'm really hungry right now and I'm really tired. So I want to hear what you have to say, but I just can't listen to it right now because like my mind is not like I need to eat <laughs> and like I'm outside of myself. That's what I always say to them. I'm outside of myself, you know, and they get it, you know, um, and just giving and you're them modeling for them a beautiful like that's cool because you're taking care of yourself. You ever hear hungry, angry, lonely, tired, halt? <laughs> That's the thing. H A L T. It? It's either if you're emotionally dysregulated, especially with kids, but adults too, you're either hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Like yeah. if your kids are dysregulated, like pause for a minute and go, are you hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? But you hit two of them. Like I'm, no, you know, no, I'm hungry no, and I'm no. tired or whatever. That's but so like, good. you're also modeling to them. Like you're important to me and I want to hear this, but I have to fill my cup up first. I'm not in a good place to help you. That's cool because then you don't blow up on them, but also then they learn to like protect their own energy and help other people by, but also protect their selves. And like, that's, a, that's really a plus parenting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I do want to touch on this. We touched on it a little bit um, in our conversation before coming here, uh, which is currently politics. The topic everybody wants to talk about. Yeah. Let's and go. we're not here to, we're not here to sway the vote. Nope. We're not here to, to 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 give any opinions on candidates or anything like that. But, um, you know, one of the things that I mentioned that I would love for you to talk about as well is, you know, really, I and mean, what we're talking about today is, you know, everyone displays their emotions in some way, right? There's, 
ex you know, we express who we are in every way, like the type of cars we buy, the where we choose to live, what we wear, right? Expression is, it's nonlinear, right? It's just everything, right? Um, it's not just art. It's not just music. Expression is everything that we do. Um, and currently with politics, that's why I loved, I think this conversation is so perfect because, you know, we are in a space where we are feeling very divided. You know, I think when you go outside, it feels very chaotic. You know, it's like, I can see the stress on people's face. You know, I can feel it. You know, it's like you feel it in the air. Um, and it really affects us, you know, and what I shared with you is what I see it as, you know, and I try to remind people and myself included is that sometimes we are dealing with people's inner child representatives. So I'm not talking to adult Joe. I'm talking to eight year old Joe who was never seen, who was never heard, who couldn't express himself, who had a view that he really cared about and no one cared that he had this view. And now that he's an adult, he's expressing it. You know, this is how he's expressing it via political views. Right. And I think we do get really affected by you know, whether we think it's going to affect our livelihoods and, you know, just we, you know, just the way it impacts our lives. So I get how people react to it. Um, and I do want to share sidebar. I did this video. It was clickbait. I probably wouldn't do it today, but it was like why I love Trump. And that was what the title was. And I got messages before people even watch the whole video. People should know me enough to know I don't I don't do political videos. So I'm never going to get on and talk about candidates or like just no, I just. I don't, I don't want to say I don't care, but I don't, that's not my viewpoint. And I don't, I don't indulge in those conversations. And I really just talked about, I love that he is showing us that we are imbalanced. I love that he's bringing out for us that we have some work to do, right? Because that adult ego steps in and an adult would say, I'm not having a temper tantrum, but what do you call it if a child does it? Right. If a child starts yelling and screaming or berating another person, I mean, look at the political commercials. It's crazy that we even live in a society that allows that. Right. You're like, this is Joe. And this is why Joe is such a bad person. <laughs> you I know. know? That's crazy. Like, oh like why God. don't you tell me what you're for rather than what you're against on either side? That's the other yeah. thing, like with all politics. Like I, I used to have a shirt that said, tell me what you're for, not what you're against. And it was not about politics. It was you know, we have the capacity to share our own message without putting other people down. Like, don't, you know, but uh, that's a uh, interesting I, uh, insight. I think definitely just like COVID, this political climate is, there is a, a silver lining that it is exposing our emotional dysregulation and our unhappiness and our lack of skills to collaborate with people who we disagree with. And sometimes it has to get really bad before it gets good. And I think there is a, beauty in that in a weird way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree. And I think essentially, you know, um, even, you know, I think even talking about how we don't honor and respect emotions yet, just from a society to say, this is a visitor, right? This anger is a visitor and the anger wants to tell you a story. If you listen to your anger long enough, you'll hear the story. You'll hear why you're so mad. And it probably has nothing to do with, with anything. Do you know what I mean? And, and it's like, if you yeah. could really get into the hearts of people, that's really what it means for me, right? Like We got to really get into the hearts of people. And one of the affirmations, I was creating this meditation and I, and I was trying to place like, what is something I see and what someone would claim to be an adult. So what is a what is a trait that I see that I would say, well, that's an adult, right? Because my grandmother, when she died, and it was really important for me to see this, she died, she was like in her late 80s. And she was brilliant. Like my grandmother was a nurse and she she did a lot of things. She met, she worked for a lot of, um, on my father's side, a lot of them were in law enforcement, police officers, firefighters. She was a nurse, but she worked with a lot of the mafia families, their parents. So she took care of their parents. So she was like very connected from that standpoint. So she would get like happy birthday from the state just because, just because like they knew her. Right. Um, but to watch her, you know, lead this realm and just be one of those older people that, you know, she just repeated her father was a firefighter. He died when she was maybe like eight or something, she just repeat that story over and over again. So you can hear her pain. You know, you could, you could just see how much pain she was in. Um, if she wasn't happy, you know, if my aunts would cook her a meal, she would like throw it on the floor, like temper tantrums, right? Just to watch her leave this earth and still display childlike, childish like 
uh, symptoms, I guess you could say. So yeah. the affirmation was adults seek solutions, right? It's just a next yes. level type of thinking because you've worked with your emotions enough to know like your, what were the three, four H's you said? I got to remember these. I feel like I got to write these down. <laughs> Is it, it's hungry. Oh, halt. Like halt. stop, halt. Hungry, halt. angry, lonely, or tired. Okay. A lot of times halt. if you're dysregulated, it's, they teach it in the kids books, but it applies to okay. adults okay. too. It does 1000% because if you really check yourself, sometimes like I'm hungry, I'm angry, I'm lonely, or I'm tired. For me, it's either hungry or tired. Uh, I'm sure maybe the other ones do kind of pop up every now and again as well too. But um, I think for grownups, it's mostly hungry and tired, you're right? Yeah, it really <laughs> is, especially tired. Woo, like tired is a whole nother level of like check for sure. yourself. <laughs> I have for some sure. night classes where I have to tell them like, listen, I am so like, don't ask me any questions right now. <laughs> I am not open for conversation and that's just the way that it is right now, but I'm letting you know. Um, but that was my affirmation that helped me to really understand who I was dealing with and if they sought a solution, you know, if they're seeking a solution and they're like, how can we work through this to me that I'm dealing with an adult? If I'm dealing with an inner child representative, there will never be a solution. It would only be a focus on the problem. And let's talk about the problem. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't, yeah. the world doesn't change by talk, like you said, we can talk about what we hate all day. We can talk about what we don't like and what we don't want, but that doesn't change anything. You know, what really changes things is to find the solution. Just like even with our emotions, what is that solution? Which I love, which you just shared so many things with me that I'm like, I'm going to apply that. Do you want to do some push-ups or do you want <laughs> Yeah, it works. I, need I love what you're, I, I think we could do two sides of the same coin here. So you're talking about mm -hmm. what to see in other people to know what we're contending with. If we get yeah. into a contentious political conversation, yep. that's important. And then I would take it back to some questions for self-reflection. If we're getting into one of these heated political debates on either side, I think it's very important to know that it's not to dismiss the issues because these issues are important to everybody and mm -hmm. we, they affect all of us, these hot button political issues. Everybody knows yeah. what they are and they affect everybody, but everybody sees things slightly differently. And so um, I think it's very important to reflect if I'm going to engage in a political conversation or a debate or a fight or anything like that, you need to know your own perspective and your internal why. Like, what am I doing here? Am I just trying to rage at this person to get it off my chest? Mm -hmm. Or am I actually trying to sway their viewpoint? Because those yeah. are two totally different approaches. If you're just like honest and you're like, I just am like a kid and I want to yell at somebody because I think my opinion is more right than theirs. Mm -hmm. Then I guess engage in that. But then I would also follow that question up with, is this serving me? Mm -hmm. Is this, is, is this anger and this division and this conflict that I'm having, I'm clearly not going to change this person's mind because you'll never yell at somebody and convince them to see your viewpoint. Never. <laughs> but anger in that form is like a punishment that you give to yourself for them having a yeah. different political opinion to you. Mm -hmm. So now I'm mad. Well, who gets the cortisol dump? Who gets all of the, mm -hmm. who's having a bad mm -hmm. day? Who gets the increase in blood pressure? Me. Yeah. So now you don't agree with me politically. And so I'm angry at you. So I'm going to yell at you. I'm not going to get you to agree with me. And then I suffer the consequences from my adult mm -hmm. temper tantrum. If yeah. you want to go about handling business that way, that's fine. That's a foolish way to lead yourself towards happiness and modeling how to share civil discourse with your, to your children. Yeah. Um, then, and then also too, I just think some perspective, I'm not saying these issues are not important. They are, but also life is very short. It's temporary. I'm halfway to the finish line. I can promise you this in a hundred years from now, we will all be dead and there'll be some other clown in blue and some other clown in red trying to pander for your vote and dividing families against each other. That game has been going on since before we were born. It's going to be going on after we die. And so like, it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean go rock the vote. It doesn't mean get don't get politically involved, but just know like this world is going to keep on spinning. Politics are going to keep, it's a business that's going to divide people and in a hundred years from now, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and me and you are all going to be dead. And it's going to be a whole bunch of different players. It's going to be people in their houses fighting over politics and two other people telling you why they're better for the American people. And so like how much of your peace and happiness and relationships do you want to give up for this system that's designed that way? And I guess my third piece would be that no matter how politically different we may seem, 
even the biggest enemies like uh, start right, start left, bro. If your mom dies, you're going to want somebody to give you a hug. We all feel grief. We all need food. We all want our cute little babies to have a bottle with, you know, like that. This is how it is. We, we are all humans and 95% of us, we're all, all the same, no matter what we look like or what our background is or what our political persuasion is. We, and emotions are the things that tie that together. We all feel joy when our kids thrive. We all feel pain and grief when we lose loved ones. And mm -hmm. if the aliens came and invaded, you wouldn't care if you were a Republican or a Democrat. We would all be teaming up to fight the aliens because we're human beings. 1,000%. And so, yeah. like, if, you know, what is the end goal? Is the end goal to shout your viewpoint in an echo chamber and divide yourself and cause anger? Or is the end goal unity and progress and solutions, like you said? And so learning to be able to create space, to have empathy for somebody else's viewpoint. Truth is not black and white. There's room for multiple truths we can feel differently about the same topic and you know is this serving you and your children and your society i don't really think ranting and yelling and fighting it doesn't change people it doesn't get more people to vote your way it causes harm and really like we need unifiers right now we need people who are willing to eliminate division and create unity and that all starts by unifying with yourself and becoming emotionally regulated understanding your why I'm not a pacifist. I'm not saying you don't draw a line in the sand and, and fight for something that's worth fighting for. But like, is this stupid road rage you're having with your neighbor because he's got a Biden or a Trump sign in your yard? Is that where you draw your line in the sand? I mean, you know, like pick and choose. Somebody's attacking you, you got to fight them. Somebody's attacking your liberty. Like there's a line in the sand and we all have to draw that. But like, we are so quick to go into battle right now with each other. And human beings need each other and we need each other now more than ever. And I think it's a damn shame that families are breaking up over politics. It, you know, I think it's a lost art to be able to listen empathetically to somebody who has a vastly different viewpoint than you and then to share yours and to say, hey, we can agree to disagree on these things, but still love and support each other. I think that's I think a lot of us have voluntarily given that up. And I think that I can't believe it. But I think what I just said there is a, is a hot topic and people don't even some people will get mad at me for saying that you should be able to sit at the same table with somebody you disagree with. I think we're doing that to our demise. Yeah. 1000%. 1000%. Oh, that was so good. I receive all of that. And that's important. Honestly, for me, that's a sign of maturity, right? When I'm willing to put my differences aside and hear you. Right. And I think I learned, you know, essentially we're learning how to listen to people's heart. Empathy is within the heart, you know, really hearing people's heart. And like you said, 100% if aliens invaded, no one would care where you're from, what car It doesn't you matter have, if that happens. Right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're Russian, that, Republican, Democrat, China, America. Out the window. We're fighting the aliens. Yes. Out the survive. window. <laughs> out the window. Yeah. You've said so, you've said so many, you know, really great things and you really did bring it back to like regulating ourselves, right? Understanding like no. our drives for what we do and what we do. That's Joe. Yeah, that's Joe. Isn't he cool? <laughs> So thank you so much for this discuss discussion that has really filled up my cup today. And I can't wait to share it with the men in my life specifically. I'm like, there's a few of them, but I got to send this to Um, What are some last words that you have for us today? Well, I think we covered everything. I'd just like to say thank you for having the conversation with me. I love your spirit and your energy. You have a beautiful calming vibe and it's been a pleasure to talk to you. And I think that the work that you're doing internally with your kids and then with the rest of the world who you coach and create content for is very important. And it's the type of thing that gives me faith and hope in humanity. So keep up the good work and thanks for becoming friends and inviting me on here. Same. Thank you. I, I always like to share with people when we feel like there's not a lot of us in the world is that um, I just think uh, the others have better marketing. They just have better marketing dollars than we do. That's it. That's true. <laughs> And I think um, that they there are a lot of people like us out in the world. And I think podcasts I are a very powerful platform for that. Like you, to circle way back to the beginning of this conversation, you were talking about feeling alone. When I was going through all that stuff, I was kind of socially isolated, but I was listening to like trauma-based podcasts and I was hearing other, nobody in my circle could was dealing with a career loss and a wife with addiction and kids dysregulated. But I started listening to these podcasts and other people in the world, thousands and thousands of people are dealing with these things. And we get in these forums and we share with each other authentically. 
and it makes somebody feel not isolated and that can be life or death for them you know what i mean to be to know that i'm i may not know you but i'm hearing your voice from a thousand miles away yes there's a connection there and i'm not isolated and so i yes keep up the good work it's very important yes what you're doing well thank you joe well let us know where can we find you Uh, I'm on Instagram uh, at the Joe Spector and all of my stuff is on there, like my free ebook and my podcast. And um, I do a little resilience newsletter every week. So that's really my hub though, like uh, Instagram and out in Phoenix, Arizona, trying to unify people who are fighting with each other over politics. You might be seeing me having thought provoking conversations in the line at target, trying to bring people together. But other than that, <laughs> I'm on the gram. I love that so much. Well, thank you, Joe, so much for being here. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this podcast. If it resonates with you, leave a comment. Make sure you go follow Joe and keep spreading your light. Because as you can see, even with this podcast, number one, we all have a story. Number two, even a candle in a dark room lights up that room. And you are that candle. So thank you so much for listening.